thank you very much both for the introduction and hi everybody. It's really great to be here and I've been following the talks uh, this week and there have been some really great ideas discussed here and I'm very glad to uh, be invited. And today I will talk about two uh, distinct uh, ideas. The first one is on suppressing errors in a quantum computer. And the second one is a technique that's quite relevant for VQEs and in general for variational quantum algorithms. Um, and it's called quantum analytic descent. It might sound uh, a bit uh, funny, but I will tell you why it is actually a quite good name for, for this approach. So let's let's just give a short introduction. So as you all know, we are, we are already in an era where we have sufficiently large quantum computers with, with many qubits, like up to 50 or even beyond. And these quantum computers can prepare in increasingly complex quantum states and so complex that we cannot even simulate them now classically. And this means we are in the supremacy regime and especially with these two recent supremacy claims by Google and, and the other Chinese uh, supremacy claim. And I have to say that in general, these are not useful algorithms. These are just to demonstrate that uh, the computers they have are sufficiently complex and cannot be simulated by uh, classical machines. But the problem is that still they have a huge amount of noise in their systems. And I think this graph here shows exactly the problem. It's a logarithmic plot of the fidelity where the fidelity actually quantifies the quality of the quantum state. And if you increase the number of qubits, you can see that this fidelity drops exponentially. And this is a huge problem. And there is actually an answer to this question. And the answer is just use quantum error correction. But the problem is quantum error correction is extremely expensive. The reason is that it needs a huge overhead in terms of the number of physical qubits. We need to encode many, many. Uh, so actually, we need to take many, many physical qubits and encode the logical qubits into a collective state. And that's very expensive. The minimum amount of qubits is five. But this, in practical scenarios, can be up to thousands of qubits per logical qubit. Uh, but in return, we can suppress errors to any level arbitrarily. And very importantly, we can efficiently do this because we only need a polylogarithmic overhead for suppressing these errors. And this also means that we can run computations indefinitely. But unfortunately, there are so many complications to implement quantum error, error correcting codes. And I don't even want to go into the details here, but I just have to say it's completely prohibitive for current quantum hardware. So that's why the idea currently is to take these, uh, let's say 50 qubits or 100 qubits and use them as efficiently as possible by just preparing very, very complex quantum states with only a few, few gates. And this in return will minimize the noise, but still the promise is that we can create sufficiently complex quantum states so that we can evaluate sufficiently complex uh, uh, expectation values on them. And then we will just use a classical computer to, in some sense, uh, process this quantum data and then tell our quantum computer how to update parameters or how to update its quantum states. And as you all know, this leads us to this typical VQE optimization problem where we measure the output, output of our quantum computer and we, in some way, we compute an update rule on our cl classical computer, and then we update the parameters of our circuit, and then repeat this iteratively. And we hope to find the optimum in the end. Uh, but for this, we need to estimate expectation values here. And it's interesting that we don't necessarily need that the state is correct. It can be noisy. We just want to have accurate expectation values. And that's why quantum error mitigation is a very, very promising technique or collection of techniques. 
uh, which is basically a cheap version of quantum error correction. And it basically just tries, tries to learn how noise affects the output of these quantum circuits. And once we learn about noise, we can figure out what might be the exact expectation value. And there are a number of different techniques to do this. The simplest one is probably called zero noise extrapolation, where we just change the value of our noise error, so our error rate. We can do this experimentally, and then we can evaluate the expectation value for a number of different error rates and extrapolate back to the zero noise limit. But there are even more, way more sophisticated techniques like the quasi-probability approach or Clifford circuit learning techniques and so on. And these are quite promising uh, and they typically do not increase the qubit count, which means they are cheap, sufficiently cheap. But the pro problem is they introduce an extremely large sampling overhead for typical scenarios. And we also need to perform non-trivial additional measures. And we don't really get any theoretical guarantees that in the end we can uh, arrive at the correct value of our expectation value. So that's a big downside of quantum error mitigation. And very recently we came up with a quite distinct approach and it sits somehow directly between quantum error correction and mitigation. The reason for that is here we introduce qubit overhead, meaning that we actually introduce redundancy. We prepare copies of the quantum states. And the idea is relatively simple. I will explain to you this in a minute. Uh, I just have to say, I put my paper on archive last year and the week after the Google team put another paper on the archive, that came up with the exact same idea, with a very, very similar approach. And it, I guess it just shows that it's a relatively simple idea that was waiting for us to discover it. And basically what we do, we prepare copies of our quantum states. Let's say we have n independent quantum processors that prepare the computational state. And at the end of the computation, we just use a very shallow circuit to bridge these copies, entangle them, and then measure the expectation value of an operator. This could be typically something like a Pauli string that we use to estimate, let's say, the energy of a molecule or something like that. And the great advantage is that we get a theoretical guarantee that we can suppress the errors exponentially when we increase the number of the copies. And this is great. Uh, but before explaining the details, I'd like to give you a little introduction how we think about errors and, and quantum states that model erroneous quantum states. And basically we use density matrices uh, to describe these erroneous quantum states. And these density matrices are quite distinct from pure states. The reason is the following. If we take pure states, we cannot classically average them uh, because of, of the phase of the quantum state. But if we create a left and right Kedbra, then we can average our quantum state and we can model classical probabilistic processes. In this case, let's say row one is our ideal computational state. Row two is a state in which some error happens to one of, let's say one of the qubits or two or several qubits, and so on. And then we can classically average over these different processes and end up with, with noisy density matrix that describes our computation, noisy computation. But equivalently, completely equivalently, we can write the density matrix in, in the form of a spectral decomposition, which means that here we have eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the quantum state. And we assume the following. We assume that the dominant eigenvector, this psi, corresponds to the ideal computational state with some do dominant eigenvalue lambda. And all the rest here are just noisy states. These correspond to some highly non-trivial processes happening in the quantum circuits. But the very important thing is all these states are orthonormal to each other. 
and that's the that's the most important assumption here that we can approximate the ideal computational state via the dominant eigenvector here. And why is it useful? It's useful for the following reason. Assume that we have no error happening in our circuit. It's the most likely event because of the dom dominant eigenvalue here, lambda. And by the way, the eigenvalues correspond to probabilities of different processes. And if no error happens, then our state is this. We get back n copies of the ideal computational state. And then if we measure the sigma expectation value on the first register, then we end up with the right expectation value that we are after. This is what we can use in our VQE optimization. However, if we have an error, it is the second most likely event that we have a single error happening to only one register. In this case, the error happens to the first register. Then it maps to the orthogonal eigenstate here of the density matrix. And then we have n minus one copies of the ideal state. And now if we measure the expectation value on the first register here, as you can see, we have error here, error here. In the end, we get something that's different than the ideal expectation value. And this is what causes the big problem and the exponential decay of, of our fidelity. However, and this is the trick in this approach, if we first swap two registers and only then measure the expectation value, then what happens is that the swap swaps these two, two registers and then here we no longer no longer have the error state but the ideal state and that means because of the orthogonality relation here we don't get an error contribution so we could successfully filter out the errors and we can generalize to this idea to any swaps the generalization is the so-called derangement operator that's here it basically shuffles all the different registers in a way that no register remains in place. And if we do that, we can actually prove that the only contributions that can pass through this filter are permutation symmetric. For example, the permutation symmetric com uh, combination of the ideal states so that all registers are completely error-free. It happens with a probability lambda to the power of n. And other contributions are the ones where the exact same error happens to every register here. But that's highly unlikely, actually exponentially unlikely. And so this allows us to exponentially suppress the probabilities of these errors. And this is actually uh, the whole idea behind the approach. And if we write it out uh, formally, then we obtain a density matrix, an expectation value. If we measure this probability here, the probability of finding the qubit in, in zero or one state, then it allows us to measure the expectation value, but with this exponentially suppressed contribution. And we can write it as the nth power of the density matrix. And the Google team called it virtual distillation. And the reason for that is this technique is actually used in, in distillation protocols, but in a different way. So the idea here is that we don't need to distill the state itself. We just need to virtually distill so that we measure something that's related to a state that we would obtain by an extremely expensive distillation protocol. But we don't need to do this extremely expensive distillation protocol. And there is one more ingredient here is the following, we are interested in this quantity, but we don't necessarily know this one. So we additionally need to measure either trace rho to the power of n, or somehow figure out what the lambda factor here is, because then we need to divide by this to obtain the exact expectation value. But it's not necessary to measure this one. That would give us a pure state, or actually that would give us a density matrix that corresponds to a valid quantum state, but it's not necessary. We can just divide by this lambda to the power of n. And the main result is 
this exp exponential suppression, it's that if we take any observable, you can think of any uh, Pauli string or even beyond that, then in general, the error epsilon a is bounded by some number sequence, this qn. And this number sequence decays exponentially with the number of copies, where n is the number of copies. And that's really the great theoretical guarantee that we can do this. And the other nice property is that this error decays also exponentially with the Rényi entropy of the quantum state. And it's really good news because this kind of NISC hardware, where we have many, many quantum gates, and each quantum gate undergoes some small error probability, undergoes some error with some tiny error probability. In that case, we get very, very high Rényi entropies for our quantum states. So that's very promising. Another result in this paper was that even if our copies are different, in fact, they can be arbitrarily different as long as the do dominant eigenvector is this ideal computational state. This could be if we have completely different uh, noise models. Let's say one, one copy is prepared by an ion trap and other copy is prepared by some completely different platform like superconducting qubits. If we entangled these two, then we would still get an exponential suppression despite we, we have totally different uh, error models. And an even stronger result is that if the copies commute, then we get back the previous results with the Rényi entropies. And here are some numerical simulations. Here it's a logarithmic plot. If we increase the number of copies, we can see that here are these theoretical upper bounds. And here, if you generally generate just, just random Pauli strings and calculate how much is the error in measuring the expectation values, you can see that these typically decay in the same exponential order as the theoretical bounds. And here's the simulation when we have completely different copies, but they share the same dominant eigenvector. In that case, we get a very, very similar result. So this is very encouraging. And one might say that, OK, but when I measure this probability, then we have an attenuated probability here. This decays exponentially, too. But the good news is that the number of copies scales logarithmically with the precision that we set. And that also means that it's probably, if we don't work out the maths, we would already expect that it's not a big deal that here we get an exponential suppression of the signal. Uh, you can think about the following way. When we measure this probability, then we basically want to perform some kind of a coin flip, where we want to estimate the bias between finding the coin on either side. But the problem is that this bias is suppressed exponentially when we increase the number of copies. But still, the copies scales only logarithmically with, with the precision. And if you work out uh, how many coin flips we need to perform to estimate the probability, it only scales polynomially. And that's great news. And it also turns out that the standard shot noise limit that we see in these usual VQE algorithms which is epsilon to the minus two, is very close to what we observe here. We just get a slightly a different polynomial order, but this f is typically small in real experimental scenarios. So that's really great news. And so far, I haven't talked about these derangement operators. These are the ones that we use to shuffle our qubits and our registers. And recall that we have, for n copies, we have n factorial different possible permutations of, the, of these registers. And derangements are a special case of permutations. These are the ones that leave no element in position. It means that every element finds a new place for itself. 
but still there is a huge number of possibilities to implement these derangements. For example, for, for two registers, we just get back the usual swap operation, where you can see that here we have the two copies, Psi1, Psi2. We swap these and we obtain Psi2, Psi1. It's quite simple. And it's basically the, it's just a variant of the usual swap test. Now, if we have three copies, then we have two possibilities. We can derange one, two, three into three, one, two, or into two, three, one. And it's up to us which one we want to use in our protocol. We only need to use one, but it, it will probably depend on the connectivity, which one we will choose. And for four copies, we already have six possibilities to perform this. And the number of possibilities will grow factorially. So this leaves us a lot of room to, to select which we want, which we want to implement. But the good, good question is, what if this derangement operation is not perfect, since it will decompose into a linearly linear number of gates, primitive gates, just swaps of two qubits. But that means for, let's say, two copies of 20 qubit registers, we have 20 primitive controlled two qubit swaps. That's already a large number. And if these gates are noisy, then that can cause us trouble. And then we might ask, OK, but these are very, very special operations because these derangements are just swaps. They don't really do anything specific apart from just swapping these, these registers. And it turns out, indeed, these operations are highly robust to errors. And here I show how we can extrapolate, use, use simple extrapolation techniques to find the ideal expectation values. And if we put in more resources, actually just linearly more resources, we can again exponentially suppress the errors in this, in this kind of setting. And that's, again, very, very encouraging. And it turns out the errors almost trivially affect this derangement operation. But there are limitations. And obviously, there are limitations. It, would, it sounds too good to be true. And in fact, the main limitation is that we cannot do anything about coherent errors. And it turns out only true quantum error correction can correct um, these coherent errors. And what I mean by coherent error is this, when our state is actually shifted in Hilbert space. This can be, for example, because our rotation angles are miscalibrated, or we have some systematic errors in, in our rotation angles. For example, instead of a pi rotation, we all the time apply just 0 0.99 times pi. And that will introduce an error like this. But it turns out, even if we have purely incoherent noise channels, even in that case, we get a slight coherent mismatch. And this approach cannot do anything about that. But there are very clever techniques to overcome these limitations. And obviously, it's up to future research to, to figure out which, one, which ones work the best with these kinds of techniques. But most importantly, variational algorithms were designed to be robust against these kinds of errors. And the reason is the following. In a VQE, we want to optimize our circuits. So even if there is um, a coherent mismatch or some systematic coherent error, we anyway optimize and we move on this variational manifold to find the minimum. And if there is a shift like this, that means that we just shift the entire landscape, but still there is a minimum. And the minimum is anyway just an approximation of the true ground state energy if we are in a VQE setting. So all these results are quite encouraging. And now I'd like to shift to a quite different uh, idea. It's related to quantum optimization. And as you all know, in many important cases, we we want to evaluate some expectation value at the end of the quantum circuit. 
and we want to minimize this expectation value with respect to the parameters. But the problem is the optimization. And I will not go into the details about questions like, how can we abo avoid barren plateaus? Or how can we find the right ANSAT circuits? Now I will assume that we have already solved these problems or that we are in a setting where we know how to overcome these limitations. And even if we overcome these limitations, then we still need to face challenges. And the problem is that if we are doing a gradient-based optimization, then we need to estimate the gradient at the end of the quantum circuit. And that may be extremely expensive. And why is it so expensive? Actually, we were wondering about this with, with a student here in Oxford. And we were considering the so-called natural gradient technique that I'm sure you have heard about this. And in the natural gradient technique, we use this Fisher information matrix to correct the gradient vector to account for the, for the right metric in the space of the quantum state. But then the question comes up. For this matrix, we have n squared entries. So we need to measure a lot of entries here. Whereas for the gradient, we only have linearly many entries. So then the natural gradient approach, approach must be more expensive than the simple gradient approach. But it's, it turns out it's not really the case. So it turns out the gradient is so expensive that asymptotically, if we get very close to the optimum point, the gradient becomes extremely expensive and the mat metric tensor becomes negligible. And we formalized these results. It's in this paper. I don't really want to go into the details, but we were thinking about how to overcome or mitigate this expensiveness of gradients. And one answer is to use more or to, to gain more knowledge about, about the structure of the surface. Because when we compute the gradient, we do not assume anything about this surface. But still, there is enormous structure in it. The surface turns out to be extremely simple, which we should use in our optimizations. And let's say if we just have a simple poly rotation gate like this one, and we have a simple single parameter, then the energy surface is just a cosinusoidal function with only three parameters, and the derivative only depends on B and C. So it's extremely simple along a single slice. And even if we have an extremely complicated quantum circuit, if we just vary a single parameter in this circuit, we find the exact same kind of dependence. And if we want to compute the gradient here, there are many works that point out, oh, in this case, we just need to use the parameter shift rule. Because if we measure two points on this curve, we can exactly tell the gradient at, at the point of interest. And there are many other works that actually propose to measure two points and then tell exactly where's the minimum and then jump directly to this minimum for a single parameter. But then we go on to the next parameter. We again jump to the minimum of that parameter and then cyclically repeat this procedure. And it can be proven to converge. But we wanted to find something something more concrete. We, we were interested in how does this surface exactly look like that we are optimizing in VQE. And it turns out, for the general case, it's not more complicated. The structure is extremely simple. We get the same cosinusoidal functions, but products of them. So. The problem in general is that we get a trigonometric polynomial, which is relatively simple, but it has three to the new terms, so exponentially increasing complexity. But the functional dependence on the parameters is just de determined by products of cosines and sines of frequency one. And that's, that's really, really simple. So the idea is, why don't we use a quantum computer to determine these coefficients? and then use a classical computer to simulate this surface and then descend towards the optimum. And we know exactly how these trigonometric functions look. 
and we can use the classic quantum computer to reconstruct these points. How do we do that? It turns out it's, it's very simple. We have these coefficients and we just apply parameter shifts here and just reconstruct the energy at given points and then subtract them and then or add them together and so on. The idea here is that we get a cubic approximation for evaluating a quadratic number of terms. It's, it's in some sense similar to the Hessian, but tailored to the particular problem. And we have this cosinusoidal dependence, which is different, different than just polynomial in theta and phi and so on. And the great advantage is the following. I told you already that we need to perform these coin flips for determining the expectation values. And when we do these coin flips to measure the energy, then because we only do a finite number of, of measurements, let's say 1,000, then we can tell exactly what is the variance of, of our coin flip procedure. And then we can analytically calculate how this variance propagates into the final surface, into the surface that we are simulating classically. And it turns out this, the variance of this surface depends only on this set of coefficients. And there are only linearly many of these coefficients. And even though the circuit complexity is quadratic, meaning if we have new parameters, we need to evaluate new squared circuits, different circuits, just like for the Hessian. But most of them, we only need to evaluate to a very low precision because our final variance is, is insensitive to those entries. And in that spirit, we can say that, oh, we then find that basically this procedure has the same complexity as just measuring a single gradient, or in fact, two gradients. But when we classically simulate this gradient descent, we can use this approximation for thousands of steps. So we would expect that we can reduce the number of shots significantly by this approach. And another advantage is that classical computing, computing power is, is very, very cheap compared to quantum computing power. And in the typical VQE setting, we just use the classical computer for some trivial tasks, let's say to to compute the update rule and then just tell the quantum computer what new parameters to use in the next round. In some sense, that's, that's a very, very simple computation. But in this case, we actually offload more work from the quantum computer and use the classical computer more heavily. And this code does basically just multiplies cosines and sines together, but many, many of them. And it is actually a lot of computational power that's needed to do this. So we developed an efficiency code, and it turns out for up to thousands of parameters, we can do this gradient descent in, in a matter of minutes. And if we have more parameters, or we decide to go for a more sophisticated approximation with, let's say, cubic complexity, then we can use more classical computing power. But the idea is then, in return, we don't need to use the quantum computer that many times or for so many shots. And indeed, we tried this out in numerical simulations for, for typical VQE settings. The last, left one is for uh, a molecule, a lithium hydride. The right one is for some local spin ring Hamiltonian. And as you can see, we are comparing here to to the natural gradient evolution, which is one of the more sophisticated techniques, which guarantees an improved convergence rate compared to simple gradient descent. But with this technique, we can see that we have an even further improved convergence rate when compared to a natural gradient. So that's great news. But obviously, we need to do, do a lot more studies to figure out um, in which scenarios this approach will work better than other optimization techniques. And that's that's an open question. It was really just the idea that, oh, in case of VQEs, the surface is actually very simple in, in its structure. So why don't we try to use this knowledge about the surface? 
And in summary, so I, I showed you this suppression technique. And in general, suppressing errors is, is really one of the most pressing matters in, in quantum computing in general. And it's still an open question how to overcome noise. Th there is a clear answer to use uh, quantum error correcting codes, but that's prohibitively expensive. So we need new great ideas uh, somehow overcome this limitation. And the technique I showed you is, is very promising. Um, it has a relatively low complexity in the sense that we only need to apply this derangement operator. But still, this can be very expensive for, for current quantum computers. And there is still more research needs need to be done in this, in this area. And also, I showed you this optimization technique that we call quantum analytic descent. Um, it tries to use explicit knowledge about the structure of the surface. And in general, indeed, the surface is exponentially complex. But most of the complexity comes from the fact that we need to evaluate these coefficients with a quantum computer. We cannot simulate these classically because that's exponent exponentially complicated. But once we use the quantum computer to do this, we can use it in our classical approximation. So in that sense, offloading the work to the classical part. And we have seen so many great uh, different emulation software here. I just want to add one more to this zoo of different uh, software. And our software is called Quest and Questlink. This is actually based on a very, very efficient C code that's very competitive in terms of speed. And the great advantage is, first, there is a Mathematica wrapper here that you can just use by this single line. And deployment is, is another great advantage. And it's the following. I write a code on my notebook like this. I write it and test it for four qubits or six qubits. And I can immediately deploy this code just by changing a single line. I can deploy it to a GPU, to a supercomputing cluster, and so on. So it's extremely flexible. Um, I can encourage everybody to just try out, give it, give it a try. And thanks very much for your attention. Wow, thank you so much, Alan. That was a super cool, super cool talk. I know uh, Sophia hadn't heard of, uh, <laughs> of quantum analytic descent when we played uh, Real or Imaginary with her earlier, but I'm pretty sure that oh. she <laughs> I know about it now. That was great. Uh, lots of interesting questions coming out of the chat. Um, so Quantum Chumba asks, how exactly does connectivity play into the decision between different derangement schemes? What is optimal for, say, all to all, and what would be optimal for something with bivalent or tetravalent connectivity? Oh, I see. Yes, uh, it's a very good question and a very, very relevant one. Uh, and I think last week or so, Patrick Kos Group put a paper on archive where they use one, I think, one particular type of derangement where you have one master register and you have, in some sense, slave registers. And then you swap the master with one of the slaves. You throw this away. You take another slave. You swap them. And so it's, in some sense, a serial approach. But it only needs to connect a connection between two parties at once. Um, if your hardware can efficiently implement this, then you should go with this one, definitely. But what if we can manufacture specific hardware where like we have two processing units on top of each other and then pairs can communicate, pairs of qubits can be communicated or it can be entangled between the layers. That's another kind of connectivity and a completely different type of derangement. And in principle, we can do that. We could even manufacture specific hardware for, for this task. I hope that answers the question. Cool. Very interesting. OK. Uh, Sam New Lives uh, also has a question. Uh, what is your plan, your next or next steps, uh, to reduce the degraded performance from measurement errors? Measurement errors. Oh, yes. So <clears throat> measurement errors definitely degrades this performance. 
Um, I don't really have a better answer than just um, go with established um, measurement error mitigation techniques. And the great advantage of this approach is that we can combine it with, in principle, any uh, mitigation technique. This includes the mitigation of measurement errors, but even during the prep state preparation stage, we could combine it with, let's say, Clifford circuit learning or, or um, extrapolation techniques. And in fact, in the paper, I, I, did, I did combine extrapolation with this technique to, to suppress the errors in the derangement process. Right. I, I was also curious um, what, uh, you know, there, there were a, a number of kind of open areas to continue to investigate here. What's what's most interesting to you? Where are you taking this uh, this research going forward? Oh, actually, so I was puzzled by this, this more like fundamental question that even if I have um, a completely incoherent noise channel, let's say a depolarizing noise, even that will definitely introduce a coherent shift to my dominant eigenvector. And I was puzzled by this. When I did simulations, I saw this tiny difference, but there is a difference between the dominant eigenvector and the ideal computational state. And I wanted to better understand this. And I'm just about to finalizing a paper about this, and I will put it on archive in, let's say, a few weeks. OK, great. I got to clear my backlog then. Good to know. Good to know. Uh, we've got a question here from uh, Ixfo Duap. Uh, he asks, to what extent does the analytical gradient technique depend on the type of gates used in the circuit? Do we always have to compile the circuit to variable single qubit gates plus fixed two qubit gates? Oh, actually, uh, I didn't explain this part. But the assumption that we made here is that we have so-called poly gates. It means that we have gates generated by poly strings. This, of course, includes single qubit x, y, z rotations. It includes two qubit x, x, y, y, z, z gates, but more general gates like Mueller, Sorensen gates, where we can entangle n qubits at once with x, 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 x type gates. So we made this assumption and under this assumption, we get this, these nice, simple formulas. But even if we have more general gates, let's say a square root of swap or something like that, or some more general parameterized two qubit gates, then we can work out very similar equations. They will just be more complicated and will probably take up more space on, on a paper. <laughs> uh, but it's definitely doable. Okay, cool. Um, uh, Sam Lives has another uh, question, more general one, um, asking for recommendations for people starting uh, into this field. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your sort of academic journey to where how you got to where you are now. Oh, actually, yes. I wouldn't say I had um, a typical journey in academia. My case wasn't as extreme as others explained it before, like maybe metric calls. Uh, but mine wasn't uh, completely straight. So I actually, as a, as a pupil in, in high school, I, I did all these science projects. I couldn't decide uh, whether to study chemistry or physics. I, I liked them both. So then I just decided to study chemistry. But then I found I'm more interested in, in maths and, and physics. So I did a PhD in, in quantum physics and foundations of quantum physics. I was doing some work related to phase-based representations of quantum systems. So I'd rather come from this abstract quantum physics and maths background. But at some point, I just decided quantum computing sounds very interesting. And when I learned about these quantum hardware that are actually coming out, and the question is whether we can make practical use of them, I, I find, find this question very, very interesting. And I think it's really something uh, that we should think about, how to use these quantum computers that are too noisy, but still represent some extremely complex quantum objects. I was already interested in this question. So I decided to dig deeper into this. So to answer the question, well, I would say 
looking at recent papers or archive, especially review papers, might be very useful. And I really pre appreciate the work of uh, PhD students, postdocs, and so on, who decide to write a review paper because then it's a very nice collection of, of the field. And we have seen quite a few review papers coming out in this area in the recent months. And I would say, if you want to get more into the quantum computing field, start reading these reviews. That's a great, uh, great suggestion, actually. I, I, I like that. Yeah, write a review paper. Absolutely. I like it a lot. Um, I have a, maybe a, a less uh, technical question for you. Um, so, you know, we had uh, the other day, um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember who it was now. I think it was, uh, I think it was Leonardo uh, who had a gaming chair with him, but he oh. said he does not, he does not like gaming in his gaming chair. He games on the couch. He uses the gaming chair for work. So I know, you know, you like playing PC games, but I see you're not in a gaming chair. Um, what, what's not. your, what's your, I guess if you're in a PC games though, you're going to be gaming in the same chair that you're using for work. Or is that so, yeah, I like playing PC games, but I don't own a chair. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> I don't own, um, um, an appropriate gaming PC. So I'm just using my notebook to play some older titles recently because I struggle to find time to to play games. But back then, I, I was really into playing games like the Edge of Scroll series, Mass Effect series, and so on. I really enjoyed these. And especially the open world games. It's, it's really oh, yeah. great to just walk around and explore huge territories do some side quests and so on. How, how many hours have you lost to open world uh, questing? To be honest, I'm I'm not a completionist. I'm okay. actually the opposite of the completionist type because I try to optimize my time spent on on a game versus how much I gain from 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 playing with the game, and I try to just play the. Uh, the main quest line, and maybe sometimes do a little bit of side quests, but uh, keep it as short as possible. I like that. That's a really, uh, really nice approach. So speaking of games, uh, we, we've been playing some games with uh, some of our guests. Um, we're not going to play uh, Real or Imaginary, who did that one already, but I, I want to play uh, Mad Libs uh, uh, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're up for that. Um, so I want how this is going to work is I'm, I'm going to give you some so I'm, I'm going to prompt you for some words, and then we're going to fill in this this uh, description that you can't see. And uh, the idea is that you know, be try to be as as uh, as almost random or interesting with your word choices. Don't overthink it. Um, try to be okay. out there, and we'll see where this goes. Does that sound good? Okay. Yeah. All right. That's no no problem. Okay. So first, I'm going to need from you a type of tea. Sorry, a type of key. A type, a type of tea, like a drink, like tea that you would drink. A type of ah. tea. Oolong. Oolong. Oh boy, can I spell that? Yeah, okay. Oolong. I like that. That's good. Okay. This is this is off to a great start. Okay. Next I'm gonna need a fictional company name. Let's see. So the ones I can think of already exist, so <laughs> <laughs> let's say circuitry. Circuitry, okay. And next, uh, favorite pizza topping? Cheese. Cheese. Can't argue with that. All right, adjective used in a romance novel. That's a, this is a strange one. Oh. Strangely. <laughs> Strangely, I like that. Okay, now this should be easy. Character from a video game. Um, let's see. I have to think about that. Which one is my favorite? <laughs> or... No wrong answers. Abe. There is an old Ape? game called Abe's Exodus. Abe. Ah, yes, yes, yes. I know. I don't know if you know okay. okay. A crime that would land you in jail. Murder. Murder. 
uh, the full name of a famous scientist, yourself excluded. I don't want to go with Albert Einstein. Let me think about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, John von Neumann. Perfect. Excellent. Uh, another excellent thing. Uh, a household item. Vacuum cleaner. All right, we're getting close to the end here. A futuristic sounding buzzword, but obviously not quantum related, would be would be preferred. Tricorder. Ooh, tricorder. Uh, ooh, a made up number. Three zillion. Three zillion? Sounds good. Three, three zillion. <laughs> uh, a piece of office furniture. A uh, gaming chair. <laughs> gaming chair. Okay. Uh, just three more to go. A child's toy. A uh, bear, teddy bear. Bear, teddy bear, teddy bear. That's good. Uh, an animal uh, that lives in cold climates. A bear. A bear. So polar bear. And uh, breakfast food. Pancakes. Pancakes. Awesome. Okay. Here we go. Here we're ready. So this this particular Mad Libs, this is a press release, okay? Press release coming out. Oolong Quantum Inc., a subsidiary of Circuitry International LLC, is proud to announce the launch of its new quantum computing platform, Cheese Cloud Quantum Services. We are so strange. <laughs> we are so strangely <laughs> pleased to release this into the world," said Abe, the company's chief murder officer. This was the first product envisioned by our company's founder, John von Neumann. Built using vacuum cleaners and backed by the latest tricorder technology, this product is the first on the market to provide access to up to three zillion qubits arranged in a gaming chair lattice. This innovative offering will unlock new applications for customers in the areas of teddy bear manufacturing, polar bear supply chains, and pancake analytics. So there you have it. Thank you so much, Balan, for being a good sport with this. Thank you for the wonderful talk as well.